In this video, we will look at the limit law for quotients of functions. In the first three videos about limit laws, we've looked at sums, differences, products, even the reciprocal of a function, and now it's finally time to ask the question, what is the limit of a quotient of functions? But first, let's take a step back and revisit the question of what is the limit of a reciprocal? What happens when we have a function whose limiting value is zero and we want to analyze the limiting value of its reciprocal? Previously, we had said use the analysis 1 over a small magnitude number will give you a big magnitude number and go from there. This is good advice. But what we said was that there were essentially four cases depending on whether the function g approach zero from positive or negative values on either side of A, and you could deconstruct a general case into one of these, and there were four cases. The problem is, that's not quite right. There's really another thing that might happen, and we can't sweep it under the rug. We're going to have to confront it. So let's take a look at this function x sine 1 over x. It's not the kind of function you'll run into very often but it does provide an example of a different type of behavior we need to know exists. The factor of sine 1 over x is going to introduce violently oscillatory behavior near the origin, which we've seen earlier. The factor of x is going to effectively squeeze the graph near the origin. The net result of this is that the limiting value of this function will turn out to be zero near the origin despite the oscillatory behavior. So to prove this, let's just, let's just look on the right side of the graph. So we'll approach 0 just from the right. We'll suppose that x is positive. We'll make the observation that the sine of anything is bound to be between negative 1 and 1 because the range of the sine function is the interval from negative 1 to 1. Therefore, the sine of 1 over x, whatever it is, is going to be between negative 1 and 1. Since x is positive, we can multiply through each of these pieces of the inequality to arrive at a new inequality. We can plot the line y equals negative x and the line y equals x, and observe that the inequality we have written here guarantees that the values of x sine 1 over x are trapped between the values of negative x and x. We know the limit of x as x approaches 0 from the right is 0 and so is the limit of negative x as x approaches 0 from the right. This forces the limiting behavior of x sine 1 over x to be the same. In other words, the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of this function also has to be 0. You can play the same game from the left to establish that the limit from the left is also 0, and therefore the limit of this function as x approaches 0 is 0. Now let's try to imagine what the graph of the reciprocal of this function looks like. We'll just take a piece of the graph where the value approaches 0 here at this intersection, and we know from work we've done before that the graph of the reciprocal will have some vertical asymptotic behavior, and the value will actually go to infinity as we approach this argument from the right. Similarly, here's a piece of the graph where on either endpoint you're approaching 0 through negative values, so when we reciprocate this piece, we'll get vertically asymptotic behavior at those endpoints, and we'll get a piece of graph that looks something like this. Once again, for this piece, these are all positive values, so when we reciprocate, we'll get big magnitude numbers. And here's the problem. The closer we get to the origin, the more often this happens. It's going to be very difficult to sketch a graph schematically at this scale, so we're going to use some software to help us out. Essentially, we've done an accordion zoom away from the x-axis. You'll notice that the scale is much larger along the vertical axis so that we can actually see some of these values. And when we plot the reciprocal of g, we get quite a mess. The question, what is the limiting value of this function as x approaches 0, has only one answer. The limit does not exist. So why do we go to the trouble of looking at this example? Intuitively, we would love to be able to say that this is a limit law. 
if the limit of a function is zero, then the limit of the reciprocal should be either plus or minus infinity. But we just saw an example of a function where despite the fact the limit was zero, the limit of the reciprocal was not infinity or negative infinity. That limit simply did not exist. If we want to salvage this intuitively pleasant law, we need to throw in an asterisk. It's not just that the limiting behavior is zero. We have to declare that g also preserves sign on its final approach to the argument in question. In other words, we have to guarantee that it doesn't go through zero and switch signs so often that it introduces the kind of crazy behavior we just saw in the previous example. If we throw in that caveat, then it is, in fact, the case that there are essentially four possibilities and we recover this nice limit law. Moreover, the mnemonic device we can use to remember it is quite nice. One over zero is positive or negative infinity, depending on how the function goes to zero, either through negative values or positive values. But wait a minute, there's a reciprocal to this law. If you were to reciprocate huge magnitude numbers, you'd get tiny magnitude numbers. And this suggests that if the limiting value of a function is either positive or negative infinity, it stands to reason that if you reciprocate that function and look at the limiting behavior, you're going to get zero. And indeed, this is another limit law that we can add to the books. The mnemonic device for this is simply one over positive or negative infinity is zero. Now we're ready to go back to this fundamental question, what is the limit of a quotient? The answer to this question is going to depend on some pieces, so we'll break up our general problem into specific cases. The limiting value of the numerator might be zero, a non-zero number, or positive or negative infinity. Similarly, the denominator could have the same three options. And of course, when we say the limiting value is zero, we're going to have to throw in the caveat that the sign is preserved on its final approach to rule out the craziness we just saw a few slides ago. So to be clear about these three cases, there's the possibility that the limiting value is zero. There's the possibility that the limiting value is some number other than zero, and it doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative, in which case we'll just say this is the finite and non-zero case. And then there's the possibility that the limiting value is either positive or negative infinity, and we'll call this the infinite case. And of course, the denominator could have one of these three behaviors as well. Zero, finite and non-zero, or infinite. Let's concentrate on this middle column first. So we're assuming that the limiting value of the denominator function is a non-zero number. To analyze this case, we'll first use simple algebra to express the quotient as a product of a function and then a reciprocal of the other function. We'll use the product law to break this into the product of two limits. And now we'll use the fact that the limiting value of g is non-zero so that we can use the reciprocal law for limits. At this point, we have the product of two quantities. And because the limiting value of g is not zero, we know the quantity in the red box is some finite non-zero number which for simplicity we could just call L. Now we'll break our analysis up into the possible fates of F. If the limiting value of F is zero, then we're talking about a zero times L case, and that limiting value is obviously zero. If the limiting value of F is either positive or negative infinity, then we're talking about an infinity times L case, in which case the limit of the product must be positive or negative infinity. If the limiting value of f is a non-zero number, then we can simply look at the limiting value on the right and take the product, which simplifies to the quotient of the limiting value of f and the limiting value of g. So let's put these three results into the column where they belong. And now we'll assume that the limiting value of g is zero. In this case, once again, we will use all our tools 
to express the limit of the quotient as the product of limits. And since the limiting value of g is zero, with the caveat that it preserves sine on the final approach, we know that the limiting value of the reciprocal will be either positive or negative infinity. Once again, we split this into three cases depending on whether the limiting value of the numerator function is zero, non-zero, or infinite. Now we look at these mnemonic results and we realize that the bottom one is positive or negative infinity, as is the middle one. But the top one is trouble. This is what we have deemed to be an indeterminate case. We simply don't know what the result is if the limit of one factor is zero while the limit of the other factor is positive or negative infinity. Let's move on to the final column. We're assuming in this case that the limiting value of the denominator function is either positive or negative infinity. As before, we express the limit of the quotient as a product of two limits. And in this case, since the limit of the denominator function g is positive or negative infinity, the limit of the reciprocal is zero. Depending on the limiting behavior of the numerator, we get these three options. The first two are clearly zero. And the third option gives us another indeterminate form. And now we've completed our table. You might notice some patterns in this table, and indeed we can summarize everything in one nice mnemonic. The limit of a quotient can be expressed as the quotient of the limits, and this result even makes sense when the numerator function and the denominator function is either zero or positive or negative infinity. So with this in mind, we can revisit the elements of the table. Let's give the limiting value of f a name, say p, and we'll give the limiting value of g a name as well, call it q. Now we can revisit each of the elements in this table in terms of the quotient of the limiting values of f and g individually. All of these results should make some sort of intuitive sense, except perhaps these two entries. Indeed, a great chunk of calculus is devoted to analyzing what could happen in precisely these two cases. It was problems that fall under these categories that really served as the inspiration for calculus in the first place. So we shouldn't feel too bad if we can't say with certainty what's going on in these cases because it took a long time for mathematicians to really figure out how to handle these cases. The other seven cases, however, you now have a way to deal with. Let's end now by test driving all of the limit laws we've learned in these last four videos. In this example, we have a function f, and we're meant to analyze the limiting behavior of the quotient of f and the sine function at x equals zero. First, let's recall what the sine function looks like near the origin. And now we're going to analyze this function first from the left and then from the right. As x approaches zero from the left, we can see from the graph that the limiting value of f is positive infinity. Meanwhile, the limiting value of the sine function is zero. Now, using our quotient law, we see that this is an infinity over zero case, so we know from our mnemonic that this will be positive or negative infinity. Of course, the mnemonic doesn't do the thinking for us. We have to analyze what's going on. Probably the safest way to do this is to imagine that what we're talking about is because f approaches infinity, we've got huge numbers, huge positive numbers, and we're dividing by tiny magnitude negative numbers because that's the way sine is behaving to the left of the origin. And the quotient of that is going to be a negative huge number, even bigger than the huge number. So we can conclude that the limiting value of the quotient turns out to be negative infinity. As we look at the limiting behavior from the right, we notice that the limiting value of f from the right at the origin is zero. Meanwhile, the limiting value of sine from the right is also zero. 
we can use the quotient law and the mnemonic here is this is an indeterminate form. At the moment, we can't say anything better than we just don't know. Eventually, we may be able to obtain some tools to analyze this problem, but at the moment, we're just going to have to say we don't know. In this second example, we're meant to analyze the limiting behavior of the quotient 4x plus 6 over g of x. The graph of g is displayed at right, and we need to take this quotient and analyze it using the rules we've developed. The numerator function is a simple linear polynomial. You may have already worked out the fact that when you want to evaluate the limit of a polynomial, you can simply evaluate the polynomial. But let's go right back to the basic laws. We've got a sum and a scalar rule at play and a constant rule. And when all the dust settles, we get a limiting value of 18 for the numerator function. Meanwhile, using what information there is available to us, it appears that the limiting value of g is 2 as x approaches 3. Now we're going to stitch these results together using the limit law for quotients. We have a limit of a quotient, and we express that as the quotient of the limits. This is the least stressful of the different possibilities for a quotient. When the numerator and the denominator are both non-zero, it's really no sweat at all. This is 18 over 2, or 9. The limit of the quotient as x approaches 3 is 9.